Thank you for listening to Liberty Christian Center's podcast. Let's join Pastor Stephen Keller for today's message. Uh, you know, so go ahead and let people know where you go to church, man. Uh, our belief is that we're going to see lives dramatically changed when all of us just rise to the occasion and, and not necessarily just share service times with people. I mean, certainly that's a part of it, you know, but more than anything, just sharing the love of God with people in any way that he shows them throughout their week. So I love that your answer to did y'all express the love of God last week was yes, because that is exactly what we as a church are shooting for. So, we've been preaching a series called Vision. How many of y'all think it's good to have some vision? As some of y'all did. I said, how many of y'all think it's good as a church to have vision? Yeah. That beautiful. Okay, good. We're on the same page. Um, you know, having a vision and seeing where we're all going together, what it does is it brings unity. You know, if, if we all know together where we're going, it makes it a lot easier for us not to get off on all these weird paths and then come together and figure out we're on 50 different pages. Um, so, you know, Pastor Paul and I, a while back, it was probably a year ago now, uh, you know, we, we pretty regularly make time to go get coffee and uh, hang out at our second office in town, the raw deal. Hey, hey. Um, but, you know, we sit there. And we talk about what's going on in our church, what's going on with our people, you know, and also what, what God is showing us as pastors just to kind of lay out. Um, and something that he really made real to us was to actually put some verbiage, put, a, put some words to the vision of our church. How many of y'all know those words? Okay, this is why we're preaching this. <laughs> So, the vision of Liberty Christian Center, and if you don't know this, I would encourage you to know this. If you're thinking about joining this church, I would encourage you, this is something that you ought to know. Um, if you're already going to this church, you know, this is, this is honestly the filter that we see a lot of things through. You know, when it comes to, are we going to do a certain event, it goes through this filter of the vision. Are we going to start up a certain group, it goes through the vision, or the, the filter of this vision. Uh, but the words to it, and again, you can write this down or whatever, but it's experiencing and expressing the love of God. Can we all say that together? Experiencing and expressing the love of God. Now, why does this matter? Well, it matters because our heart is, is that we aren't just going to be people that cubby ourselves away and experience God on our own terms and in our own way, hidden away, no, what we're, go what we're gonna do and what we're endeavoring to do is just get to know God better and better and by the power of his spirit in us, reaching out into the world. And in every interaction that we have, actually demonstrating God-like love. Unfathomable, mind-blowing, incomprehensible God love. Now, when we say experience and express, uh, the funny thing is, is sometimes we tend to kind of like separate those things, right? Like experiencing God is one thing, and expressing God is another thing. We're talking about church and evangelism, or we're talking about Sunday morning and then outreach programs or whatever. And honestly, that's not what we're talking about. What I want to submit to you today is that honestly, experiencing and expressing the love of God is just this one beautiful pool of the same thing. There's not really a whole lot of sense in differentiating. So here, let me lay out some scripture to you real quick. Mark 12, verses 30 through 31. Jesus said this. How many of y'all think that it's a good idea to have our church line up with some Jesus stuff? <laughs> he said this. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Let's stop there. What's that saying? That's all of us, man. That's going all out. You know? That's throwing yourself entirely into loving God, into a relationship with him. 
Next verse. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Did y'all hear that? There is no commandment greater than those two things. Now here's my question. If we're supposed to devote all of, let's go back to verse 30, all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength simply to loving God, then how is there any space to love our neighbor? You know what I'm saying? Would it be fair for us to say, well, I don't, I don't have any, any room in my heart to love my neighbor because I just love God with all of it. I don't have any room in my soul to, to love my neighbor because I'm just, I'm too, I'm too heavenly minded. Do you get what I'm saying? The beautiful thing is, is if, 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 if we really look at what this is saying, it's got to be saying that when you throw yourself unapologetically, undividedly into a loving relationship with God, the natural, supernatural byproduct of that the inevitable result will be the latter commandment, won't it? Living a life all out for a loving relationship with God, it's going to produce some fruit. And that fruit, is it going to be a holy life? Sure. But I think a lot of people stop there. They're like, oh, it's just going to be transformation. You're going to stop doing this, and you're going to stop doing this, and you're going to stop doing this. You're going to start wearing this, and you're going to stop saying that. And don't get me wrong. There is transformation that happens by the Spirit of God, okay? But when God talks about the two greatest commandments, loving your neighbor is like way up here. And that's what God largely considers fruitful lives, is ones where we are so full and overflowing with the love of God that we overflow into the lives of those around us. Y'all picking up what I'm putting down? Yeah? Okay, so, um, y'all ever wonder what monks do? Am I alone in this? Are y'all alive? <laughs> So do you all ever wonder what monks do? No, John, you've never wondered that? You know, I watch these movies, and, like, it looks noble, right? Like, and, and don't get me wrong, I know there's all different kinds of monks, and they're doing all sorts of things, and you got, like, nuns who are, like, out on the beach ministering to people and stuff like that. But the people I'm talking about is the people that just, like, totally isolate themselves from the world, you know? And they do so in the name of the Lord. And it's like, man, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing all the time? Just hanging out, singing Gregorian chants? I don't know. Thanks. I think the further you hold the mic away, the more reverb you get. It's like, you know? But you see, that's not the kind of life that we were called to live. Can I tell you that? We, we were not called to live a life separated from the world. Come on. Did you know that? But I think a tendency within Christianity, and it just happens, I don't know where it comes from, but it just happens, is we tend to only surround ourselves with other people that believe things just like we do and all that. We were called to be the light of the world and able for people to see the light of the world. we got to be perched in some places where we're actually visible. You know? You can't hide away for the rest of your life and use, I'm studying the word of God. That's where I'm spending my time. I don't need to go interact with people is an excuse. Hot mama. Now, don't get me wrong. I love that you're getting built up in the word. I love that you're going after God. But I'm just saying, just being real, y'all, we need to, like, actively engage with the world. That's what Jesus did. 
right? Right? Oh, I know this message. I know this message, and I know that, that it's going to be powerful in your life and impacting in your life if you will simply embrace the simplicity of the gospel, loving God and loving people with his love. So check this out. John 15, verse 8. says this. My Father is glorified by this, that you what? Bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Let's keep going. Just as the Father has loved me, come on, dude, yes, me. I have also loved you, abide in my love. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Let's hit the pause button again. I've heard a lot of people talk about, if you are a disciple, you will produce fruit. And they forget the message of love that is tied all the way throughout this statement. Let's keep going. Verse 11. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made what? Full. Next verse. This is my commandment. This is what he's talking about. That you love one another just as I have loved you. That takes the bar that I had set by the previous set of scripture and puts it like way up there. Because like loving others as I love myself, I know Jesus probably meant something really awesome by that, but sometimes when I read that, I'm like, well, I'm like my, my own worst critic. If I'm going to love other people the way that I sometimes love myself, like... I don't look all that pretty. But when I go, whoa, I love other people the same way that, that, that God loves me, that changes the whole game. Because what does that look like? That looks like the cross, don't it? Do you know that Jesus loved, forgave, died for the very people that were pinning him to the cross? That stretches me, just being real. Because natural human love is often reactionary. You do something to me, and therefore I respond, and I either love you or I don't. Jesus had the worst done to him, and he still did the best unto them. That's our call. Isn't that beautiful? Now, I know some of y'all might be sitting there and going, that's impossible. I can't do that. Well, you're right. You can't do that on your own. And that's the beautiful thing is God doesn't ask us to do things and then just go, okay, have fun with that one, guy. Let's see if you can figure this out. Because he knows that we would make a hot mess of it. We were never, ever intended to live a life without him. Ever. That's where things went. But that wasn't his intention. Everything that we do in this life is to be done with him and by his strength and by his power. So can I, can I ask y'all something? Don't dumb down God's commandment to love to a suggestion. Did you hear me? Sometimes, it's funny how hard people will stick their heels into the ground with, like, things that tend to be on the legalistic side of things. But then, like, the love thing is just like, and if you can fit love in there, maybe do that. Maybe love somebody. It's like the mushy after submission. It's like, no, that's, that's the greatest commandment. It's greater than all of them. So, as I was praying over this message um, and just kind of asking God to give me some, some words to, to, or a picture kind of to sum up what he was showing me. What came up was deep roots equal wide branches. Deep roots 
equal wide branches. I'm going to read you some scripture and we'll talk more about it, but just think about that for a second. Deep roots equal wide branches. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. This is the Apostle Paul saying this. He says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through who? His Spirit, that's talking about Holy Spirit, in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, what? And that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Let's go back to verse 17. That you may be rooted and grounded in love. You guys, this is what we're getting at with the whole experiencing and expressing the love of God thing. Liberty Christian Center, people of Liberty Church, I want to just submit to you, let's be rooted and grounded in love. Is that okay? Rooted and grounded in love. By the power of his spirit in our inner man. Holy Spirit will make these things real to us. And you know what's beautiful? Then it goes on. It says that we may be able to comprehend the incomprehensible. That we may be able to see a love of God that blows not just the minds of those that are it's being dished out to over there, but that it blows our minds. We ought to be loving people with a love that makes them go, nah, uh No way. Not me. No way. That's the kind of love we're to be dishing out. It's, it's mind-blowing. But I'll tell you what, is, is we're rooted and grounded in love. You know what happens? As our roots run deep into that, our branches grow far out. Now, what am I talking about? Stephen, you sound like a tree hugger. (laughs) Branches, trees, roots. Hey, man, it's in the Bible. I'm not making this up, okay? What I'm talking about is the branches of your influence are going to be spread abroad as you dig your roots down in to his love. Do you hear me? The branches of your influence will be spread abroad as you dig the roots of your heart down into the love of God by Holy Spirit. This is where transformation happens. This is where impact happens. So let me ask you something. What does your posture look like? Some of y'all just sat up. Hup! Call me! I'm a sloucher. Y'all slouch? I realized that, man. Like, on a plane, Kara totally blew my mind. So, Kara and I, you won't believe this, but we almost have the same length of legs. Isn't that weird? That's blowing some of y'all's minds. If I had her come up here right now, you'd believe it. It's strange. I'm all torso. I don't know what happened. I tried to use that as an excuse for not knowing how to swim just this morning. And somebody was like, nah, dude, Michael Phelps is all torso, and he's like really long arms. And I was like, don't take away my comfort, you know? I thought that was a good excuse. But, you know, like I'm on a plane, and, and just being real, I, I, I sit like a G. Like I'm like, 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 like I'm slouched back, so much so that like I got to put my feet on the on the handlebars of the seats in front of me because I know that if I put my knees on the chair, I'm like pushing that person forward and that's really mean. You don't want to do that to anybody. You'll get a stinkier eye than you've ever gotten in your whole life. But that's not, kind of, that's not the kind of posture I'm talking about. I'm talking about in your everyday interactions, what does your posture look like? Is it like this? Good. 
Is, is it like this? Or is it like this? You want to know what I love? What's the posture of the cross? Christians, we don't look like this. We don't look like this. We look like this. Amen. For real, though, you know? Jesus embraced people. Yes, he gave them the power. And yes, he equipped them with the Spirit of God who absolutely can bring transformation and change. But before anything, he embraced people. Did you know that? Y'all remember the woman that was caught in adultery? Uh, y'all remember? Okay. <clears throat> See how many y'all are reading your Bibles, you know? No, I don't remember that. Get in the Word! It's okay. Maybe you've never been in there. That's cool, too. Well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what happened, okay? There was a woman, and there's a bunch of these weirdos running around who think they're really holy and stuff. And so they're like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go catch a woman in the act of adultery. How do you accomplish that without getting all sorts of weird? Gotcha! Like, who were these dudes? Anyways, let's say they did it by normal means. They, they just found out she was in adultery, okay? What they did is they brought this woman, Jesus was ministering in a place, and, and they brought this woman before him. And they're like, hey, Jesus. They were tattletales, man. They were like, we caught her in adultery. The law says you're supposed to stone her. What do you say? And Jesus, man, you got to love this guy. <laughs> you got to love this guy. He's just like, well, how about this, guys? Whoever among you is without sin, go ahead, stone her. And they were just like, oh, snap. All right, Jesus, you win that one. We'll be back, you know. And they are. They always come back, you know. They always have, like, another religious accusation for him, you know. <laughs> but so Jesus, the holiest one, right? The holy one. Yeah. yeah. Jesus, the holy one, what does he do? The only one that could have stoned her. Goes up to her. He forgives her. He loves her. He embraces her. And then says, rise, sin no more. The embrace comes before the change. You can't accept people to change without the power of God living in them. That's, that's, it's impossible. We've been called to dish out a love that embraces people even in the mess that they're in and say, hey, we are all in need of a Savior. To this day, I am in need of a Savior. I don't judge you. I don't look down on you. I don't think that you need a Savior any more than I need a Savior. We all need Jesus. Did you forget that? We do forget that when we judge. That's what's happening. We're forgetting the magnitude of God's love for us. And we're forgetting the fact that God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8, baby. That's big stuff. So in your interactions, I would just encourage you, like, like I did this the other day. I was in the raw deal, and, you know, usually I'm, y'all know me, you know. I'm like, hey, you know, how are you? Hey, yeah, da, da, you know. But, you know, I was kind of on a mission. How many of y'all are ever on missions? 
you know? You're like, I don't have time for nothing right now. I just need to go. The church needs coffee. I need to go get this ground. I'm going to get in. I'm going to get out. I'm going to get here. We have a meeting. Yeah! But I was in there, and I was waiting. Can we talk about everyday stuff? This is just everyday interaction. This is the life we live, right? You find yourself in grocery stores. You find yourself in coffee shops. You find yourself in all sorts of other places that I don't even want to know about. But when we're in these situations, I, I realized that while I was waiting there, there was just something about my posture. I was kind of like, and I wasn't even being grumpy, you know? I wasn't even being grumpy. I was just waiting. But I realized how closed off. I, I, I was like intentionally closing myself off from interaction. And you know what? Sometimes we do this when we don't even have a mission. How many of y'all use your phone as an excuse? Huh? Anybody? No? Kelly's got a hand up. Thank you, Kelly wins the honesty award today. I know it. I know we do that. But I just want to say, man, like, open yourself up a little bit. Open yourself up a little bit. Open your arms. Start to talk to people. Encourage people. Build people up. Go talk to them. Engage with the world. Because if all of our friends, just like, can we be honest here? If the only people that we interact with are other Christians, how is anyone going to come to hear the gospel? Huh? Hey, hey, guys, can I just be real with you? If all of your friends, if all of your interactions are with Christians, get outside your box. Get outside your box. Now, don't get me wrong. You got to balance things out a little bit by having homies. That's largely what church is for. We come together, we're built up, we're edified. But I just want to say, man, like, we need to be also interacting with people that desperately need to hear the gospel. And sometimes that's just through a loving relationship where eventually you fall in. Hi, that was me. I ended up hanging out with these loopy people long enough. And I was like, wow, what you have is real. But you know what? It took some time. It took some time for that relationship to get there and for me to be like, oh, wow, this is real. But it also took people reaching out to me, people hanging out with me. To this day, I'm amazed that you let your daughter hang out with us crazies. <laughs> you know? Like, no exaggeration, snorting stuff off of toilets. That's how jacked up we were. But here I have this fine little thing. My wife, in case anyone's wondering. <laughs> I'm not just like hitting on a stranger. <laughs> and then you, hey, you know. I'm married. Hey, JCKK, Jesus, Kara, in case anyone was wondering. My covenant partners, hey, huh? See that? But Kara and I hung out a long time. And Kara, straight up, I remember drives that we had where I would straight up tell her, you seriously believe like, you seriously believe that these dudes who wrote this stuff happened to just get perfect God across? I was like, the Bible is nonsense. For real. Hi, I'm Stephen Keller. I'm associate pastor at Liberty Christian Center. It's so crazy how you'll do that, isn't it? The Word of God sustains me, feeds me, gives me life. Listen, people sound a lot more critical and smart than they actually are. Did you know that? I was just some dummy making claims. You know, I, I was watching this, this, this thing on YouTube, God help us, you know, but I was watching this thing on YouTube, and there was this guy, he's a TV night host, and he's really well known just for hating Christianity. 
and, and for hating Christians, you know? Uh, and I heard the things that he was saying, and, and I feel like the selection process for the preachers that they have on there is just, like, unfair, you know? Like, I feel like I'm going to, like, put a submission in, be like, hey, bro, can I come on your show, you know? I should do that. Babe, for real, had me do that. I'm not even kidding. But who knows if he'll take it, because I feel like he just selects the dudes that he can, like, totally demolish an argument, you know? But I hear him talk about the Bible, this guy, and you know what his argument was? I know the Bible. I've taken a whole class on it. <laughs> really, bro? Like one class. Secularly and critically criticizing the Bible is going to give you a balanced weight of Scripture? That sounds like a smart perspective. Huh? But you know what's weird is critical people sound smarter. You know, I was reading a book actually last week. It was a book called Originals. And it said that when you frame the same statement critically or positively, people think the critical person sounds smarter. Isn't that wild? Isn't that wild? Listen, man, people spout stuff off, they're just talking. And that's cool. Some of it's heartfelt. Some of it's garbage. But don't let these things that they're saying, like, spook you away from them. Listen, if you're genuinely living your life in a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord, and, and his love is genuinely flowing out of you in your everyday interactions, what do you have to be afraid of? Right? This ain't some, like, defense, like, I need to prove you wrong, bro. This is just like, yo, this is a real part of my life. You can say whatever you want, but, like, you're basically telling me, like, like it's, it'd be the same thing as coming along being like, Stephen, Kara isn't real. It's like, yeah, no, she is. Uh, hung out with her this morning, you know. We had some really good times. She said some things to me that totally blew my mind, you know, some things that I couldn't come up with on my own. So don't let critical thought, critical sayings, critical stuff make you afraid of people. People are just talking, okay? They're just talking, and the world needs words of life. That's what they need. They need words of life. And listen, when people are just being real and they're loving in a real way, I'll tell you what, man, God words slice through all the nonsense. When I finally had a God encounter, woo! I didn't care what I believed preliminarily. I was just like, dang, this is good news. Which is what the gospel is. So don't be intimidated. Is that okay? Now, I'm not telling you to run up to people bashing them, calling them stupid. You know? Oh, you think you're a smarty pants. You're just a dummy. Receive the gospel. No. I'm just telling you, don't be afraid to actually develop relationships with people that believe and even say things to your face that are so contrary to you and so contrary to your God. They are not criticizing your God because they do not know your God. Do you know that? If they, 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 most of them are just talking out of... They're just talking. <laughs> Reel me in, Holy Ghost! <laughs> Can I just read you all some stuff that I got written down? That's probably safer. <laughs> I don't know what I've said to you so far or not, because we're just kind of out there right now, which is great. I love being in this place. But can I tell you something? In filling of the Spirit automatically produces outpouring of his love. Infilling of the Spirit of God produces outpouring of the love of God. There's no such thing as being too spiritually minded to be any earthly good. That's non-existent. Is you actually genuinely 
are led by the Spirit of God, and as you let Him fill you up with the life and love of God, you're going to start seeing this stuff come to pass in your life. Rather than being the, the cubbied off monk, Gregorian chanting like this, you're going to start reaching out and loving people, embracing them. If there is a monk listening to this who happens to sing Gregorian chants, I love you. I'm sorry if you feel like I'm making fun of you, but hey, you need a relationship with Jesus too and express that to the world. So live your life with the posture of the cross. Live your life with the posture of the cross. Real quick, how do you deepen your roots? 1 John 4.19. Can I give you all some homework? Is homework okay? Will you actually do homework? <laughs> I got a head shake. Thanks, Dan. And roots. Can I give you all some homework? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep asking until you say yes. Can I give you all some homework? Okay, now you can't lie about this part, so don't say yes unless you mean yes. Will you do this homework? I, I appreciate that some of you didn't say yes because you don't know what I'm asking yet. Maybe I'll ask you and then you can say yes or no. How's that? Read First John 4 this week. It's not that long, okay? Read First John 4 because if you read that and if you slow down, Okay, don't just try to quick read through that because John's getting like deep. But if you slow down and you read through that and you ask the Spirit of God to show you some things, I think it's going to change the way that you see some stuff. I really do. So now I'm going to ask you, can you, will you do that homework? Okay, cool, beautiful. Here's a little snippet of it. It says, we love, why? Because he first loved us. This is how we operate. Realize God's love for you. And it's going to inevitably cause you to love those around you. Check this out, Romans 5.5. 5. Remember how I said you can't love people with a God kind of love in your own strength? Do you remember that? If you didn't, I said it. Hi, it was a while back. Come on, man. Paying attention, I love it. It says, in hope does not disappoint because what? All right, four of y'all are listening to this. Because what? The love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The love of God is not something that you have to like try to reach for, grab from somewhere. The love of God, if you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there's something amazing that happens. Holy Spirit comes and moves on the inside of you. Okay? Some of y'all are like, what? Somebody moves inside of you? Huh, what? It's okay, just chill. Just chill, okay? I know some of this stuff is wild and it blows your mind, but I can attest to it is true. The love of God has been poured out into your heart by Holy Spirit in you. So as we live this life, just yielding to the Spirit of God and saying, hey God, I know you're in me. I invite you to lead me, be my nourishment, be my life. Be my director, my comforter. Show me the way to go. You know what's going to happen? You're going to suck up the love of God, and that's what's going to come out of you. I want to be a fountain, baby. You know? How many of y'all have ever heard that portion of Scripture where it talks about uh, the, we'll be like trees planted by rivers of living water? Yeah? Uh, that says when you do the Lord's commandments, that will happen. Again, what are the Lord's commandments in the New Testament that are larger and all-encompassing of all other commandments? Love God, love your neighbor, right? So as we do that, we'll be like trees planted by rivers of living water. The water, the, 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 the nourishment of the love of God by the power of Holy Spirit in us gives us life and pours out of us. You can't put a bushel basket on a fountain. Do you know that? Jesus said, be lights in the world. Shine. Don't put a bushel basket over it. Try to put a bushel basket over a fire hydrant. Huh? That's what I want to be. I want all of us to be messy fire hydrants of the love of God and the power of his spirit. I want people to be like, wait, can you really love that person? Yeah, I can. 
That person raped you as a kid. Can you really love him? Yeah, I can. That's real. This stuff is not playing around. This love is all-encompassing and unfathomable. But it's real. It's real. And it's strange. It's crazy, but it's God. Okay. So God's in you. Hey, it's awesome. Um, last portion of Scripture, I'll wrap up with this. We're going to read 1 John 4, 17 through 21. And we're going to read this in the message. 1 John 4, 17 through 21. And this does not take away from your homework. Y'all are like, hey, man, we're already like this many verses done. What's that first thing say? What's it say? God is love. God doesn't just love. He is love. I don't even know what that means. Can I, can I be real? I don't even, like, I can't even fathom that. Like, God is love. And that's not some, like, make-believe message thing. That's all over in 1 John 4 and some of the very literally translated Bibles. God is love. Check this out. When we take up permanent residence in a life of love, we live in God and God lives in us. This way, love has the run of the house, becomes at home and mature in us so that we're free from worry on judgment day. Our standing in the world is identical with Christ's. Check this out. There is no room in love for fear. Isn't that cool? Why? Because love fills up. There, there ain't no room for it. That's what I'm trying to get at. You're going to see things, it's things transform in your life that it's just a result that there's no more room for them. If you'll dive into the love of God and let that be your nourishment, like all the other stuff, like, like y'all ever seen a, a fly land on a cup that's pouring over with water? Let me explain that. If I put a cup right here, an empty cup, right? Could a fly land on the edge of that cup? Yeah, yeah, he could. Now, let's say that cup was overflowing with water. Could a fly come and land on the edge of that cup? No. No, it just can't because it's overflowing with whatever. I want to be overflowing with the love of God. That's my endeavor, man. Okay, so... There is no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear. Since fear is crippling, let's keep going. A fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment, is not one yet fully formed in love. Huh. Reading on. Oh! Oh! Come on! I, we're, we're, okay, I'm going to read this to you, and then we're going to read it together. Because this, this is what we need to be about. It says, I'm going to read it to you first. We, though, say that's talking about me. Oh, gosh. Thank you, Mary. Gah! We, though, are going to love Love and be loved. First, we were loved. Now, we love. He loved us first. Can we say that first part together? Actually, let's say the whole thing together. Say, we, though, are going to love. Love and be loved. First, we were loved. And now, we love. He, yeah, come on, Jesus loved us first. Some of y'all are like this, man, Stephen, you're like just basically preaching the same message every week. You're darn skippy. You better believe 
This is the message that I'm going to preach. You know, Pastor Paul said something incredible. He says a lot of incredible things. But remember, they're just God ideas. <laughs> but we were sitting in his office a little while ago, you know, and I was talking about sometimes I, sometimes I get frustrated. Can you all believe that? Sometimes I get frustrated, and, and I, I get frustrated, honestly, by empty speculation. It's one thing that really, really frustrates me. It's one thing, I think it really frustrates me because I'm really prone to do it. Um, I could, if God didn't correct me, and if I wasn't led by him, I could totally become some theologian that just sits in a, in a room in a desk far away from everybody and just like delves into the scriptures and says, oh, this is, this is deep, this is meat, and, and, and doesn't go out and interact with the world. Y'all won't believe this, but I'm not really an extrovert. <laughs> I know, isn't that crazy? It's weird. But naturally speaking, like, I, I'm good. Man, we, we, we can't be like that. We can't be like that. So I was talking to Pastor Paul about this, and he said something. Because I was like, man, you know what? People, they talk about love, and they talk like, I just want some more meat. I need a meatier sermon than that. I need a meatier message than the love of God. You know what he said? He said, you know, the meat is in the doing. And I was like, whoa, bro. Now, what does that mean? That means that we've embraced the message that God loves us, right? With unfathomable, mind-blowing love. Is that the, is that, have you received that yet? Well, we're going to have an altar call at the end, okay? So if you didn't say yes to that, I'd encourage you to pray with us. But we've embraced that. And you know what's funny is sometimes... We get bored. We get bored. The love of God just ain't cutting it anymore. The love of God is just not good enough. So now I'm going to get really complicated. And I'm going to start to get all wrapped up in all sorts of other stuff. What's the why? If, if, if the why of what you're doing is not to experience and express the love of God, if it's not to love God and love your neighbor, then I'd, I just tell you, hey, man, you might be caught off distracted with speculation. The meat is when we take the message we've embraced and start to do it. Whoa! That's pretty wild. Because that gets us to engage. That calls us to get out and do something. Amen? Thank you for listening to Liberty Christian Center's podcast. To partner with this ministry or for any additional information, please visit libertychristiancenter.org.